Gulf War, an aircraft previously unwanted became the most valuable member of the American arsenal, the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II. More than the publicity, uh, the weapon system was really vindicated because it, it was a proof of concept that people that were associated with the airframe uh, knew that it could do the job, but not a lot of other people did, especially some of the senior Air Force leadership. Uh, and it was, it was very rewarding to go out and, and uh, kick butt. We, we probably took a lot of heat from all our friends in, in the Air Force and Navy and other airplanes because it's slow, it's ugly. You know, they like to uh, rib us about that, but the reason it was so successful in the, in the Gulf War is that um, you know, it's not really about looks or about speed, it's about firepower. I and mean, the A-10 can really deliver a lot of ordnance in uh, a very precise manner. The A-10 basically is a gun that they decided to make fly. The rate of fire of our gun is around 3,900 rounds per minute, or about 50 to 70 rounds per second as the gun comes up to speed. That does not sound like a machine gun. Uh, that sounds like a, a very unhappy lion or tiger or beast of some sort because it, it, it has a roaring sound. When the time came to name this intimidating airplane, only one beast came to mind. Now, obviously, when the A-10 follows along a long line of the distinguished hogs, someone had to come up with a hog-like name for this airplane, and, and looking at it, the obvious hog-like name for an airplane that's this ugly would be the Warthog. I think its mission of uh, ground attack uh, brought on some of that. You know, it's uh, down and dirty in the mud, like a Warthog. After its rousing success in the Gulf War, few remain unfamiliar with America's Warthog. During the war, hog pilots flew 8,100 sorties, destroyed more than half of the Iraqi armor and artillery, assisted in search and rescue missions, hunted scuds, and often operated in the darkness of night. The airplane's remarkable durability and the hard work of Air Force pilots and mechanics enabled the Warthog to operate with a mission capability rate of an astonishing 96%. And in a tribute to its toughness, only six of the 144 Warthogs deployed to the Gulf were lost. The Warthog is one of the most formidable airplanes in the history of aviation. Although this highly maneuverable airplane can carry a remarkable 16,000 pounds of mixed ordnance, it is the massive 30 millimeter Avenger cannon which places the Warthog in a class of its own. The Avenger can fire 70 rounds a second and is the largest gun ever put into a fighter airplane, capable of killing tanks, trains, boats, or anything else that gets in its way. With an impressive mixture of agility, rugged toughness, and devastating firepower, the A-10 stands as one of the world's great planes. A sight becoming more common throughout the American military, a complementary mixture of full-time Air Force personnel and Air National Guardsmen combined to keep planes like the Warthog in a constant state of readiness. Bob and I are both crew chiefs in the Maryland Air National Guard. We're responsible, our unit's responsible for maintaining 17 A-10 aircraft. Bob's a full-time member of the Guard, and I'm a traditional Guardsman. When I'm not at the Guard on my one weekend a month, I'm a Baltimore City police officer. On a typical Saturday, we'll come in about 6.30 in the morning, I'll stay till about 6 o'clock at night. Usually we'll fly 10, 10 airplanes to land again, send up 10 more. In the hangar right now, they have a, there's four airplanes in there. One they're using for load crew training. One I believe they're doing some sort of flight control maintenance on. 
and the two in the far rear are both down for phase inspections. All right, this airplane right now is in the uh, is in the phase inspection, which is accomplished every 400 hours, flying hours. It has come in for a major inspection. And during that inspection, they basically open the entire airplane up. And in doing that, they inspect uh, front compartments. The uh, the gun gets ins gets inspection. The engines get inspected. The wings, the gears. You have to, um, special inspections that have to be done. TCTOs, and basically it gets an overall look at everything. Okay, part of the uh, A-10 in phase inspection process is the armors. They've taken this gun out and inspected the gun bay, and now they are in the process of preparing to put the gun back in. Our primary function is to remain combat ready. In other words, to train to the same level of proficiency as our active duty counterparts, such that if the level of tasking, the level of involvement of our uh, Air Force reached the point where it couldn't be completely handled by our active duty units, then the Guard and Reserve is ready to fill in and fill in on very short notice. So usually on a uh, drill weekend or a UTA we call it, uh, we put together a scenario for the day, a mini war for a day, and we have intel, we coordinate with intel and all the different shops, and we go out and basically execute a war plan for that for one day. With the recent downsizing of the active duty Air Force, units like the 175th Wing of the Maryland Air National Guard have become integral participants in any mission undertaken by the Air Force. About 25% of the 175th Wing are full-time employees of the Maryland Air National Guard. The remaining members, traditional guardsmen, leave their families and employers for training one weekend a month and also to serve 15 days or more of active duty each year. This is, of course, an Air National Guard unit made up of uh, primarily prior service pilots that came out of uh, active duty units and moved on to a civilian occupation. And in many cases, that civilian occupation was the airlines. And they fly two aircraft now. They have their civilian jobs uh, with their civilian airlines, and they come in on weekends and some off times during the week to, um, uh, to fly this airplane. Amongst the proud and select group who call themselves hog pilots, one stands alone. Lieutenant Colonel Ron Henry, who's been flying the airplane since its introduction into the Air Force, is the only hog pilot to have amassed more than 4,000 hours of flight time in the A-10. Nicknamed the professor for his academic and meticulous approach to his job, Henry's invaluable experience and insight have helped countless younger pilots master their craft. I was a volunteer for this assignment back in 1977. Uh, the airplane was brand new. Every airplane that enters the inventory has a certain mystique associated with it. Uh, and in 1977, the A-10 was introduced at Myrtle Beach Air Force Base, South Carolina. And the combination of Myrtle Beach Air Force Base and a brand new airframe made it the most desirable assignment in the United States Air Force in the late 70s. And there was no problem getting people to volunteer for this airplane. I can't understand why there ever would be. I have seen the airplane evolve over a period of, of 20 years. I started flying this airplane in 1977, and it's changed quite a bit. It was a very simple, austere airplane in its early days. It was designed that way, uh, designed to cost very, very little. But uh, the airplane has proved so survivable and so indestructible that uh, the mission has evolved and the complexity of the airplane has increased over time. Uh, when we first started flying the airplane, 
we had uh, basically three radios and a, a navigational receiver, and that's really all we had. We had no computers on board to help us uh, guide the airplane or help us aim the weapons. Quite a bit of money has been spent on the airplane since its uh, uh, introduction to the fleet uh, in terms of retrofitting the airplane. We now have a uh, very capable air-to-ground computing system that helps us aim our weapons. Uh, helps us aim not only the 30 millimeter cannon, but also all the gravity weapons that fall off the bomb. Good enough to, uh, to win uh, the Air Force's uh, biannual uh, gunnery competition in 1991. pilots until we're 55 years old, an opportunity you usually don't have in the active duty. Uh, we, we enjoy flying, obviously, more than anything in our career, uh, and that's why we joined the Guard. Affection and enthusiasm for flying the Warthog makes the rigorous training seem less demanding than it is. Hog pilots can ill afford to be unprepared for the challenging missions the A-10 must perform, and keeping the unit ready is a full-time occupation. We train continuously, not just on weekends. We run a flying operation here four to five days a week, and with the luxury of an airline schedule, many of our pilots can come in and fly several times a week if they wish, and we can maintain the same level of proficiency. In the past two years, many of these Maryland Guardsmen have twice left their families and full-time jobs to assist NATO forces in Bosnia. Despite the serious nature of their service, these hog pilots feel their affection for the warthog helps them keep things in perspective. I think we're a little bit more casual and, and uh, not as threatened about our ego per se, but uh, uh, it's a single seat airplane so you get to fly it by yourself. You don't have to talk to anybody else about what you're doing. We always fly in two or four aircraft and we're, we train routinely at low altitude, 500 feet or uh, you can go lower in certain areas. And that, you know, moving around at 300 knots, that's a lot of fun. Flying the hog has, has got to be as fun of, as any fighter to fly. It's single seat, it's a, a, a VFR mission, which means uh, you don't have to fly on predetermined routes. Uh, you can navigate with much more freedom, uh, and it's, it's just a great deal of fun. I think it's uh, the most enjoyable type of tactical flying I could ever hope to do. In January 1973, the Fairchild Republic Corporation unveiled the airplane the Air Force and the Army desperately wanted, the A-10 Thunderbolt II. It was not a pretty sight, but it was exactly what the military needed. The conflict in Vietnam had painfully illustrated the need for a new aircraft to handle the difficult task of close air support, a role the A-10 was methodically designed to perform. This task is one of the most difficult in all of aviation. The Warthog must loiter around the battlefield while providing support for ground forces and destroying enemy tanks, vehicles, and artillery. And this job must be performed at low altitudes under heavy enemy fire.
That's why this airplane is so ugly. This airplane is optimized to perform the close air support mission. It's designed to fly slower than most. Slower because it's necessary to keep the good guys and the bad guys in sight if you're going to deliver ordnance in close proximity to those good guys. The A-10 evolved from lessons learned in Vietnam, but it was in reality designed to provide close air support in Europe. The A-10, with its tank-killing ability, stood as an integral part of NATO's strategy to match the threat of Soviet tanks, which stood poised to storm across Germany. Forty years earlier, the Germans had unleashed upon the world the power of close air support. By the summer of 1939, Germany's resurrection into a military power was complete. The Nazi regime combined a huge, highly mechanized army with a devastating fleet of 4,000 all-metal aircraft. Hitler's air force, the Luftwaffe, pushed the envelope of war into a terrifying new era. The strategy behind the design of the Luftwaffe was close air-to-ground support. A strategy unveiled with terrifying precision during the Nazis' invasion of Poland. In a pattern destined to be repeated throughout Europe, the Luftwaffe soared ahead of Hitler's highly mechanized army and pounded enemy troops, artillery, and aircraft. Within ten months, Europe had collapsed into the iron fist of the Nazis, a testament to the brutal effectiveness of their military machine. In the wake of the German victories and the emerging threat from Japan, American airplane manufacturers began designing and manufacturing airplanes at an extraordinary rate. Of all the American fighters from World War II, one simply stands alone, Republic's P-47 Thunderbolt. More than 15,600 P-47s were manufactured, more than any other Allied fighter from World War II. Nicknamed the Jug, the Thunderbolt was the largest of all the Allied single-engine fighters and weighed an astonishing eight tons. Armed with 850 caliber machine guns, the Thunderbolt presented a formidable force. Driven by a 13-foot propeller and a 2300 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engine, the P-47 was the fastest U.S. fighter and could reach speeds of 428 miles per hour. With a range of more than 1,000 miles and a cruising speed of 350 miles per hour, the P-47 starred throughout the war as an invaluable escort for bombers and as an integral support airplane for Allied ground forces. Along with planes like the North American P-51 Mustang, the P-47 provided vital Allied support for the Normandy invasion, repelling German troops and weaponry which defended the shores of France. Coordination of troop movements in sync with aerial support was crucial to the success of the Normandy invasion. On D-Day alone, more than 14,000 sorties were flown by the Allies in preparation and support of the initial invasion. The Allies learned the lesson of close air support quickly, and the legendary P-47 Thunderbolt helped bring the Allies victory in Europe and in the Pacific. After World War II and in the wake of the tremendous success of the original Thunderbolt, the Republic Corporation began developing the lineage of jet airplanes which led to the Warthog. Republic's first F-84 Thunderjets were straight-wing jet airplanes which were armed with 6.50 caliber machine guns, had a range of nearly 1,500 miles, and a maximum speed of 620 miles per hour. The first prototype flew in early 1946. These F-84s were the original hogs. Nicknamed as such because on hot days, the airplane would often struggle to get off the ground and would sometimes tip over, 
leaving their stout noses rooted in the mud. Thus, the first hog was born. All told, more than 3,300 of the original hogs were built, serving throughout the 1950s and into the 60s. Republic continually upgraded the hog, and in 1952, they produced a swept wing version, known as the F-84F Thunderstreak. The legacy of the hogs continued when pilots christened the Super Hog. The Super Hog, capable of a speed of 685 miles per hour and a range of 1,650 miles, soon developed into an integral member of the U.S. Air Force. It could carry a variety of rockets and bombs, and Republic built more than 2,700 Super Hogs. The F-105 Thunder Chief, introduced in 1956, demonstrated that Republic was not going to rest easy after the success of the F-84. And it did not take long for the F-105 to be given a hog name of its own. As the F-105 was introduced, the previous F-84 pilots who transitioned into the F-105 looked at their very sophisticated Cadillac airplane and thought of it as the Ultra Hog and the 105 became known as the Ultra Hog. Capable of speeds in excess of 1,200 miles per hour and a range of 2,000 miles, the Ultra Hog demonstrated the rapid evolution of the jet from an imperfect machine to a sleek vehicle with power, range, and firepower. Designed as a high-speed interceptor, this large fighter bomber was armed with a GE M61 Vulcan 20mm gun and could carry Sidewinder missiles. The Ultra Hog could also carry nuclear warheads in its bomb bay, and ultimately, nearly 900 F 105s were built. The final Hog in Republic's proud lineage evolved from the American experience in Vietnam. The war fought against a desperate and determined people in a climate brutally hostile to man and machine pushed both to their limits. In the battlefields of the harsh, humid jungle, troop support was a foremost concern for the American military. Helicopters quickly proved their merit in this role, and the Huey paved the way for armed close air support. Although helicopters retained a mobility advantage over the fixed-wing aircraft, the firepower and speed offered by airplanes such as the A-1 Sky Raider led many to believe a new fixed-wing aircraft was needed to fill the role of close air support. The uh, A-1E Sky Raider really uh, illustrated a need for a uh, aircraft that was maneuverable, close to the ground, close to the bad guys, where you could look out the window and see what you were attacking to differentiate between the friendlies and the bad guys in a, uh, a very reliable manner. Fairchild Republic delivered the first production model of the A-10A to davis monthan Air Force Base in October of 1975. The suggestion that the plane be called the Warthog in honor of Republic's hog lineage and given the ugliness of the airplane did not sit well with the brass of the Air Force. The plane was officially named the A-10 Thunderbolt II in honor of the legendary performance of the original Thunderbolt in World War II. But to its pilots, and ultimately to anyone familiar with it, this airplane has only one name. But it's a very affectionate name. No Warthog pilot is ashamed to call his airplane a Warthog. <laughs>
The A-10 basically is a gun that they decided to make fly. It's a 30 millimeter, seven barrel Gatling gun, shoots at 4,200 rounds per minute, and they bolted wings, a fuel tank, a pilot, and some engines on it, and it goes out shooting at tanks and any other uh, targets of opportunity. Um, this is a 30 millimeter round, it's a training round, it's been polished as a presentation round, but this is the size of the actual round. Projectile is up here, and you can see 30 millimeters is the, is the width, the diameter of the projectile. And as you can see, it's quite a large round. It weighs about one and a half pounds per round. And our planes carry 1,150 rounds of this. To give you some idea how long the gun system is, is the gun barrels actually end here. And the gun barrels start about here. The gun rotor is in this area. The hydraulic drive mechanism, the two drive motors are here. And the ammunition drum starts about here and extends all the way back to here. Okay, as you can see, everything from forward of the, of the wing is devoted almost entirely to the gun system. The pilot's floorboards are actually the mounting surfaces on some of the gun structure. And with the exception of the electronic controls and the battery, almost everything is the gun. When the Air Force drew up the specifications for the plane, they wanted the capability to kill tanks. Early on in the design process, Fairchild Republic decided a 30-millimeter Gatling gun would be the ideal weapon of choice. But the sheer size of the 20-foot GGAU 8A Avenger cannon presented a design problem, for which there was only one solution. Design the plane around the gun. The Avenger is a seven-barrel 30-millimeter cannon, which delivers a frightening burst of destruction. The gun fires shells which are a foot long and weigh nearly two pounds. Fully loaded, the gun weighs two tons. Well, the gun's a 30 millimeter. It's uh, the largest gun, you know, in an airplane. Uh, well, a fighter type airplane. There's some transports that carry bigger guns, but uh, it's, it's very precise. Such precision allows hog pilots to hit targets up to two miles away. And with a muzzle velocity of 3,450 feet per second, the gun can fire an average of nearly 70 rounds per second. One shot can destroy a tank. The projectile itself is exceedingly uh, lethal uh, in its um, anti-armor form, the armor-piercing incendiary. A very small slug of depleted uranium is actually what's delivered on target. And it uh, strikes the target with uh, almost 12 times the kinetic energy of, the, of its uh, predecessor 20 millimeter round. Uh, even though it's only 50% larger in linear dimension, it has 12 times the kinetic energy on target. The tremendous recoil force of the gun led to its positioning slightly offset to port so that the firing barrel is exactly on the center line. This avoids the problem of asymmetric recoil forces. It produces as much recoil as the engines produce in forward thrust. Theoretically, if uh, you had the ammunition and could hold the trigger down long enough, the airplane would come to a complete stop because the gun would win the tug of war. The 19,000 pounds of recoil forces dictate that the Avenger is usually fired only in short bursts of about two seconds, an exercise which also avoids ammunition wastage and barrel overheating. Despite its incredible power, the gun is by no means the only threat the Warthog poses to enemy forces. Uh, the A-10 is uh, it's an attack airplane, and that's a uh, euphemism for bomber. It does primarily drag bombs around the sky, uh, although we tend to uh, employ the gun whenever possible because the gun does give us the option of standing off from the target, 
sending ordnance a mile, a mile and a half downrange, and then actually departing the target area without having to overfly the target. However, the airplane can carry up to uh, 16,000 pounds of uh, releasable external stores. And that, I think, you'll find if you check your history books, is uh, about four times what a World War II B-17 could carry. The A-10 carries its massive load of 16,000 pounds of mixed ordnance on eight underwing and three under-fuselage pylon stations. These 11 hardpoints allow the A-10 to be armed according to the task at hand. This right here is a ECM-184 pod. It's an electronic jamming device. This is a uh, Mark 82. This right here is a uh, cluster bomb. The variety of armaments available to the Warthog is extensive, including AGM-114 Hellfire anti-tank missiles, Sidewinder missiles, and a selection of both smart and dumb bombs. Although we carry dumb bombs or unguided bombs, uh, we have a uh, state-of-the-art delivery system. It's called CCIP, uh, constantly computed impact point. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to deliver stupid bombs or dumb bombs uh, with great precision. But the uh, typical combat loadout of the airplane then would include the 30 millimeter cannon and almost 1,200 rounds of 30 millimeter ammunition, plus six bombs, um, an assortment of Maverick missiles, the air-to-air -air missile, which uh, we carry, the AIM-9 Sidewinder missile, which we carry for self-defense. Armed to the teeth, few can challenge the firepower of the Warthog, and none can dispute its toughness. The airplane, it is, has often been said, uh, and more often uh, as a form of criticism rather than praise, that this is the only airplane that the Air Force ever bought that was designed to take hits, not avoid hits. And it's quite true. The airplane was designed to, to take hits and absorb damage and survive. Every aspect of the Warthog can be traced to the simple concept that the airplane had to survive its grueling mission and the A-10 was designed with several thousand pounds of uh, titanium steel surrounding critical flight components, one of which of course is a pilot. And this was a, an intentional design decision on the part of the designers wherein they were willing to sacrifice fuel or, or ordnance load in favor of survivability. Reinforced with nearly 3,000 pounds of titanium armor plating, the Warthog can survive direct hits from armor-piercing and high-explosive projectiles up to 23 millimeters. 1,200 pounds of the titanium surrounds the cockpit, enveloping the pilot in what is commonly referred to as a titanium bathtub. This bathtub of one and a half inch armor gives Hog pilots added security as they undertake their dangerous missions. One of the features that gives the Warthog its undeniably unique profile is the placement of its engines. The A-10 had to have two engines for survivability. Fortunately, during the early stages of development, the designers found out that GE was working on turbofan engines for a new Navy anti-submarine aircraft. Turbofans had made inroads into civilian aircraft, but had not been much use in the military sphere. 
These engines held several advantages which made them an excellent choice for the A-10. They offered high fuel efficiency and they were less noisy than turbojets and had a lower heat signature. Once the designers chose the type of engine, another issue arose, where to put them. The area under the wing was reserved for the heavy ordnance load. Eventually, the area near the back of the fuselage proved the best location, and placing the engines there also offered a number of advantages. It negated a potential yaw problem, decreased the probability that foreign objects might be sucked into the engines, and removed the engines from the major flow of the exhaust from the gun. The forward fuselage and wings also shield the engines from ground fire in the frontal section. And the vertical fins and rudder guard the engine's heat signature from the side, alleviating some of the aircraft's vulnerability to heat-seeking missiles. The Warthog's toughness is compounded by a number of structural and system redundancies. The dual redundancy of the hydraulic flight control systems is also backed up by a manual system. This enables Hog pilots to fly and land even if hydraulic power is lost. The Warthog's extraordinarily high mission capability rate during the Gulf War directly resulted from a design dedicated to ensuring the plane could be serviced and operated from bases with limited facilities close to the battlefield. Many of the A-10's parts, including the engines, main landing gear, tails, and vertical stabilizers, are interchangeable left to right. Interchanging as well as cannibalizing parts between aircraft is a standard maintenance procedure, one used with much success during Desert Storm. Uh, the shape of the airplane, uh, the fact that it's battlefield repairable with very simple surfaces, was all built into the airplane because the designers realized this airplane's probably going to take a hit. The mission of the Warthog is such that hits are inevitable, and there have been and will be instances when the pilot must abandon his hog to save himself. I'm the life support superintendent here at the Maryland International Guard, and part of my job is to ensure that pilots can remain safe while flying, but also in case of an emergency they have to eject, that we supply them with survival gear to ensure their survivability on the ground. And part of that gear that we would pack in their kits is provided here on the board behind me on display. And a couple of those items. First, outside of a, a large kit, we have two small kits that are contained inside. And inside these small kits would be the items that we have shown on the wall. And let me point a couple of those out. Obviously, we have the mittens and socks, both of wool, used for wintertime warmth, obviously not a problem now. We've got your knife, which is one of your, your basic utensils in survival. And we have a container to hold water. Water is one of your primary needs in a survival situation. And we do supply many packets of the flexible drinking water there with them. We do have food, but that is not as important as water. We also have, probably getting into the most regarding rescue would be the flares which we have the handheld launching flares. We have other flares here to direct rescue aircraft in to pick up that pilot. And as soon as that pilot would eject and hit the ground, his survival radio, very important to talk to other aircraft in the air to let them know what his situation is, and also to talk to rescue to direct them to his location. Part of the A-10's mission is to fly low to the ground to give close air support to the troops there. So naturally, this is going to put them in harm's way, and leave them open to gunfire, missiles, and so forth. So the A-10 pilot probably finds himself in, in more jeopardy than, than the fast flyers flying in much higher altitudes. It's important that these items be there. Now, it, it's something that a part of our training, or a lot of our time is spent in training the pilot for something he may never need. However, it, should he need it, 
He needs to know that it is there and it will work and fortunately could save his life. We've got uh, the latest and greatest equipment that we can have out there, and it's constantly being upgraded. They're saying that we'll probably have it until 2025, so it's around for a while. Uh, most of ours are 78, 79 version models out here. And so that's a pretty good long time for an airplane to be in service, and it's constantly being modified, and it's got a lot of capability. The Air Force's plan to keep the A-10 as an important member of the American arsenal comes as a vindication for hog pilots who never doubted the airplane's ability but had good cause to doubt if anyone else shared their feelings. Unproven in battle, much of the Air Force brass did not think of the warthog as an integral part of the post-Cold War strategy until the winds of war swept across the deserts of Kuwait. You know, the mission changed a few years ago before we were looking at a high threat scenario in uh, Eastern Europe. And then uh, with the change in the p political climate, uh, all that changed. And now we're looking at conflicts like uh, Bosnia and Iraq, where uh, the mission is different. And this airplane is well suited for both those missions in Iraq and Bosnia. Many doubted whether the Warthog could adapt to the new missions of the post-Cold War era. But the Warthog rose to the challenge. And during the Gulf War, served brilliantly in a variety of roles. Despite only flying 30% of the sorties, the A-10 was responsible for more than 50% of the confirmed bomb damage. And only six airplanes and two pilots were lost, a remarkable rate considering the danger of the missions. Given the heavy use of the airplane, it did not take long for the Iraqis to become all too familiar with the Warthog. There was a quote from one uh, captured Iraqi who said that um, it was the most feared airplane, I, I think largely because we spent a lot of time over the troops, over the army, you know, where some of the other airplanes were attacking strategic targets, buildings and bridges. Uh, maybe the troops didn't have as much uh, exposure to, to those airplanes, but they saw the A-10, and they were never quite sure what, it, what uh, target we were going to choose. So, you know, there's some concern on their parts being down below, not knowing uh, we had when and where it's coming. We had 144 airplanes stationed over there, and it was 24 operations. We had two night squadrons and five uh, squadrons on the uh, on the day schedule, and we just totally saturated the air with A-10s, you know, 25 miles deep. So that's all they saw continuously. And if you can imagine sitting on the ground wondering if you're the next target. It was a big psychological game that uh, was. And listening to the gun, the gun makes a, a real. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but it makes a great roar and it echoes and you can hear it for quite a way and having to listen to that uh, hour after hour, day after day, I'm sure it took its toll on them. Since the Gulf, the, the major change to the A-10 has been uh, night vision goggles. They've redone all of our instrument panels and uh, consoles to make it uh, night vision compatible. So now pretty much we do everything we did uh, in the Gulf in, at day, at night now, which is pretty much double the capabilities of the airplane.
With the A-10's role in the Air Force cemented well into the 21st century, the Air Force and the Air National Guard will continue to keep the Warthog combat ready, demonstrating a successful adaptation by the military in a changing era. Units such as the 175th Fighter Group must remain ready to take the Warthog wherever it may be needed and must be ready to serve side by side with the active duty units. So far, they have done so without exception. Uh, we have, in recent months, undertaken the same tasking that our active duty squadrons have undertaken. We have been to uh, the European theater to support the operation in Bosnia over Bosnia. We had guard units deployed to the Persian Gulf and performed admirably. I mean, there was little to no difference between there was. I, I, I must I must brag to some extent. There was no difference between their performance and the performance of, of the active duty units there. Once deemed too slow, too simple, and too ugly to be of much value, the A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, now stands as one of the world's undeniable great planes. Its outstanding maneuverability, deadly firepower, and legendary toughness are testaments to a successful design concept. The pride and affection felt by Hawk pilots and crewmen for their airplane unrivaled. For these soldiers, it was merely a matter of time before the world recognized the greatness of the extraordinary airplane with the unforgettable name, the Warthog.